Today, I had the pleasure of speaking with a man who proposes that his company may be able to fix some of the huge flaws in the system of modern healthcare through his company that utilizes the concept of crypto medicine. So I hope you enjoy. I, if you like this video, please click the like button. If you enjoy this content and want more, feel free to leave comments and be sure to follow me on YouTube if you want to support me. I hope you enjoy. Hi everybody, NeuroGal here. Uh, today I have special guest Brennan Hodge. Uh, thank you for joining me, Brennan. Thanks for having me on. So Brennan is an entrepreneur and he is a uh, the founder and CEO of a new startup company called Citizen Health. Uh, just a little background, um, I'm a physician and um, the, the reason why I'm interested in Brennan's new company is because as all of you are aware and every, pretty much everybody who's watching has probably had uh, an experience with the modern healthcare system. and. Most of us are very well aware that um, there are a lot of um, complicated aspects to it that hinder our ability to give good care and patients um, are often not satisfied with the care that they receive. And so Brennan has created uh, a very novel new idea uh, with his company, Citizen Health, and I wanted him to join us today to talk a little bit about it. And he incorporates something a concept called crypto medicine. So thank you, Brennan, for joining us. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your new company, Citizen Health. All right, well, I'll start with myself. And I was, uh, let's go back about 10 years ago. I had all intentions of going to medical school. As a matter of fact, I was about to apply. And the week that I was going to apply, kind of had a change of heart and change of mind and realized that my passion was more on the economic side and the business side of medicine. And I figured I could make a bigger impact on healthcare from that side versus actually practicing medicine. Um, so I withdrew out of that master's program I was in and went to uh, finish up grad school of business. I got an MBA. I went off the startup road a couple, few years, started a couple startups. Um, started a web development company. We did marketing, software, uh, just kind of full stack creative agency. Um, from that, we had a big pharmaceutical project and that software project turned into Farmedio. It's a, that was my previous company, a pharmaceutical uh, software analytical platform for specialty pharmacies, compound pharmacies, and pharmacy benefit managers. And that right there opened my mind and my eyes to a whole different world than uh, I just didn't know existed terms of insurance and I'll try to sum up this story it was about between 2012 to 2016 all this went down uh, but we we allowed these these mom and pop pharmacies just your retail pharmacies to expand their sales forces and you don't think of just a corner pharmacy having a sales force but these pharmacies converted themselves to compounding pharmacies um, just like transdermal pain medications or really just anything that needs to be customized for a, a child, like putting a medication on a sucker or something, like really cool use cases. Mm -hmm. And I, I was in it for the personalized medicine approach. I thought this was a good avenue to start um, focusing more on, on that side of it. Uh, but it turns out these pharmacies figured out a way to game the system, um, insurance being a system. Uh, but it was set up this way. There were some laws and bills that were passed in, in 2010, 2011 that allowed these pharmacies to instead of uh, previously they could take uh, a compound of medication that had like five ingredients and they could bill for the most expensive ingredient. Mm -hmm. Great, right? But then this bill passed and now they could bill for every single ingredient in there. Okay. So they went from making $1,000 per prescription to $5,000 per prescription. Mm -hmm. well, then that's when they started came in. They started figuring out what other ingredients to throw in this to get max reimbursement. They could care less about if it helped the patient. And uh, this is where I started to start and realizing something was wrong. Uh, when I was watching a sales rep, a pharmaceutical sales rep, make $500,000 a day in commission, like half a million dollars a day. And I started seeing this and I realized that Man, there's a big problem here. And insurance companies are paying this. I mean, they're contractually obligated to pay this. This was you know, in contract. Mm -hmm. So what, what I saw was a, about a billion and a half dollars of I'm not going to say fraudulent activity, but just unnecessary activity. Mm -hmm. And that was just a drop in the bucket compared to everything that goes on in healthcare. So when I saw all this and I 
I realized that you know this is causing a lot of the problems in in healthcare in terms of not being able to treat the patients you want to. Uh, your patient's going bankrupt because it costs so much, and a lot of the problems, you know, I believe, came from the ability to have to game this insurance system. So I'm kind of getting off track here, but that was me up into Citizen Health, and then I realized that we can cannot continue doing this. So I kind of had a change of heart with this too, and wanted to pivot Farmedio into Citizen Health. And this was about middle 2015, end of 2015. Well, the FBI made up my mind for me and they raided a bunch of our clients. So I decided to, to sell that, shut it down, and uh, move on to Citizen Health. So that was in January 2016, and three months later, we were pretty much done. So I spent all of 2016, all of 2016 and 2017 learning every single thing I could about healthcare and every touch point, the economic side of it, the financial side, everything about healthcare. I, mean, I read a lot of books, listen to a lot of podcasts, really try to figure out exactly where the problems were at in healthcare. And it kept coming back down to health insurance, having this intermediary in the middle um, dictating who gets paid what. And more and more I looked at it, I'm thinking, they're really not needed. So then I started doing some math, and I've got a very extensive Excel spreadsheet to look at. Uh, but it comes down to the amount of money we actually pay, and I say we as in the American people as a whole, as a collective. If you look at every single dollar we contribute in terms of our premiums, our out-of-pockets, our co-pays, deductibles, all of that, and the taxes that we pay for Medicaid and Medicare, you're looking at about $2.6 trillion. That's how much we, the American people, put into the healthcare system. Well, then I started trying to figure out how much does everything actually cost? Mm -hmm. Most people don't even know what their services cost. I mean, you prescribe something or a treatment, and it's hard to know the price. Mm -hmm. So it took me a while, and I started digging down into the cash price of a lot of the, the most procedures in America, about it's about the top 100 procedures, which makes up almost 95, 98% of everything. Mm -hmm. And if you just paid cash, you just went to the doctor and whipped out your credit card and paid directly, it would be $900 billion. You can round it up to a trillion. Okay, so we spend 2.6 trillion and it really only costs a trillion? Like, where is that extra gap? Where does that go? Mm -hmm. Well, then it starts going to all your hospital system shareholders, you know, pharmaceutical companies, it just kind of goes on to all the, the players in the game that actually don't provide the healthcare services, all your administrators, all the, the excess stuff that you need to facilitate the insurance uh, system. So when I saw all that, I realized that, okay, we cannot continue down this path we're going because, I mean, everybody's seen the charts, it's just, we're literally going off the charts in terms of spending, and our uh, life expectancy is not looking great at all. Uh, so I realized that something's got to be done. And that's about the point in time I decided to start Citizen Health and uh, completely rebuild it. As in, like, if we blew up the current system right now and we had to start fresh and we brought the smartest people to the table, I mean, we brought the best technology that we have now and the technology that's going to be possible here in the next five to ten years mm -hmm. and started rebuilding it with that in mind, forgetting all the biases of the past, what would that healthcare system look like? And that is what Citizen Health looks like. So it's kind of me in a nutshell. Right. That's really mm -hmm. exciting, and, and you bring up some really good po points. Oops. I think my gain is too high. Um, so, so you bring up some really good points about the intermediaries playing a big role in um, why healthcare is so expensive, and the big discrepancy between how much the actual costs of procedures and drugs and um, services the actual costs of what they are versus how much are charged to the insurance companies and how much the insurance companies pay for it. And you also bring up another really good point about the the lack of transparency between what the patient is what whatever the patient is getting and the cost of what they of what they're getting. So, you know, when a person gets a hospital bill, they don't really they all they do is get all they get is like a uh, a final number, yeah, a final number, which is usually in the thousands, if not tens of thousands for a hospitalization, um, but it's not broken down. They don't know whether the hospital charged the insurance company $500 for a Tylenol or $5 for a single pill of Tylenol. There's no transparency, and so that's a big issue, and so I think your concept of taking out that intermediary that, um, is, 
is a, a great idea, and um, and it seems it, it seems like this uh, model that I recently heard about called the direct primary direct primary care or direct care I, is that what it's based on? Yeah, uh, that, you know we can start at the top and say membership medicine. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, membership medicine is the concept of subscribing to a physician to their services, and that's kind of all encompassing. We have, I believe, concierge medicine above that, which is kind of like premium care, uh, kind of in conjunction with health insurance. But then you drop down a little bit lower, uh, direct primary care, and it is a subscription to your primary care doctor. And it is what it sounds like. It's a subscription, just like a Netflix subscription. And it's, I would say, probably national average is about eighty dollars a month. I think, mm -hmm. uh, very affordable. And that's not just one visit a month. I mean, that's as many times as you want to see your physician. And you can call them, you can text them, you can have a video conference with them. Um, they're like your doctor friend, and that's what they like too. They want to sit there and have a relationship with their patients and actually get to know them. Um, because your current primary care doctor, their average patient panel, take 2,500 patients. I mean, you're just literally churning patients in and out. I mean, the average is like seven or eight minutes per patient, and then half of that is the doctors turning around, typing on their computer, not even listening to you. I mean, that's just reality, and doctors hate it, patients hate it, yeah. doctors are getting burnt out with it, mm -hmm. and now these direct primary care doctors, they're, they're cutting up their insurance contracts. I'm not playing that game, not doing it, I want to help my patients. Mm -hmm. So now they can sit down with the patient and 45 minutes, just learn every single thing about them. You know, what is the actual problem that's causing this? What's the root cause of your high blood pressure? You don't need a uh, list I don't need to write you a prescription. I might need to just say, hey, you need to start walking every afternoon every evening. You mm -hmm. might need to get better sleep. Let's change the root cause of your problem so we can fix it and mm -hmm. just increase your health versus just patching it up and seeing you again in 30 days. Mm -hmm. that's, that's reactive medicine. That's kind of that's what we have now, just reactive medicine. Right. And uh, we want to focus more on the work. Direct primary care is focused more on that proactive side of health, you know, mm -hmm. trying to stop things before they happen. Bringing um, the medicine but, back to medicine and the enjoyment yeah. of, of the relationship between physicians and their patients. Yeah. So uh, that that is what we're building off of, and I, you know, I've been following direct primary care since about 2012 when I heard about it. I'm thinking, what is this? Mm -hmm. You can subscribe to a doctor. That's amazing. And then that's that's sort of what started triggering some of these ideas I had. You know, because I was reading that doctors are loving this. There's no going back. Doctors don't try this for a year and say, oh, that's not for me. No, mm -hmm. they absolutely love it. Like doctors are quitting the old way, moving this, um, and the patients are. I mean. Their health is increasing. There's not too many studies that actually prove this, but um, you because can, it's new, still not, probably, right? yeah. Uh, but self-funded employers. Now this is really big with self-funded employers. Now there are studies that show this. These large employers that do just pay their own medical bills, uh, they are saving 30 to 40 percent on their healthcare expenditures by going with a, a direct payment approach, direct contracting, and having on-site physicians or near-site physicians. Um, sending their employees to them. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we're talking about if you're spending millions of dollars a year and you're saving 30%, that's nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's significant. You can give that back to your employee, raise their salaries, and contribute back to the economy. So the self-funded employers are definitely uh, the are going to be our first target with this. Uh, we can get in that a little bit later on. But uh, this new model is it, not limited to just primary care either. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. We're looking at, okay, it's working for primary care. How can you bring special into this? Mm -hmm. uh, and that is actually one of our first pilot programs is with a direct primary care doctor here in Mississippi. And uh, this is a common problem with these DPC docs is if they do have a patient that might not have insurance or they're just on this cash pay mentality or, mm -hmm. or plan, and if you do have to refer your patient out to a cardiologist, how do you do that? I mean, you don't know the price of that, that visit or those tests. Mm -hmm. So now we're creating a way where the, the primary care doctor can create their own specialist networks. So now they can organically create their own direct pay networks with full transparency. And they can send their patient over there. They know exactly how much that's going to cost. So the idea is to eventually start structuring this into subscriptions for health, we're calling it health as a service, now where people can just um, subscribe to a cardiologist, subscribe to in different types of cancer care or diabetic care, just kind of going within the list um, and really flip the model on how healthcare is paid for. Mm -hmm. so that you go to the subscription model and it makes sense. 
So right. it's gonna be, it's gonna be a difficult sell once you get into the specialties and sell specialists like yourself. Um, but I think it's gonna be feasible. Yeah. But, uh, once again, that's that's a work in progress. That's a few years off. Yeah. But, uh, that's that's the model we are looking at. And you know, I will say right now, and uh, there's 25 states that have passed bills uh, that say this patient and doctor uh, subscription this relationship does not fall under insurance regulation. So it's not regulated by the insurance commissioner. So mm-hmm. innovation is thriving in this environment. Uh, I know there's probably about eight other states that are looking favorably on this. So in the next couple of years, you know, with the same the administration we have, it's, I mean, this is going to snowball. More and more states realize, hey, this works. Right. And actually, states are getting into this. They're looking at the direct contract model. That's exciting. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of positives for this right now. Yeah, and, I, and I'm sure um, with the increasing amount of dissatisfaction among providers, um, I, I agree with you. I think a lot of providers are probably going to jump ship from the standard healthcare model. Yeah, we give me the number right now. I, the estimates are about like four thousand primary care doctors are doing this right now. Oh. There's over four hundred fifty thousand direct or primary care, and yes, family practitioners, geriatrics, mm-hmm. OB, and all that stuff. But still, we got a long ways to go, and this really just started in the past ten years. Yeah. Less than that. And there's this thought, this this concept that um, you know this is this direct care model is um, otherwise known as concierge care is only for the rich patients. But that's actually not true, is, is that correct? That is correct. I mean, yeah, I don't have any stats, but I'm just hearing from people, uh, a lot of, as a matter of fact, the last conversation I had with a primary care doctor, he said, you see, some of his patients were the, the cooks at this resort, and they were paying $70 a month, you know, they didn't have insurance or it was a, very high deductible plan. But anyways, they were subscribing 70, 70 bucks a month. Mm-hmm. And also the CEO, CEO of that resort was also his patient. And they were both paying $70 a month. Mm-hmm. So you got to think about it. They were both receiving the same amount of care um, for the exact same price. I mean, you, you know, concierge medicine, it's, uh, it has its place. I mean, if, if people want a better service, if they want their doctor to hop on a plane and fly out across the country to see them, yeah, they want to pay for that, great. But uh, and that's just that's not feasible for the average everyday American. That's what I think direct primary care is targeting. Mm-hmm. And so, tell me about the um, how cryptocurrency plays a role in in citizen health. Sure, that's uh, there's a lot to cryptocurrencies. It's hard hard to put your finger on exactly what it is. But let's back up and talk more about blockchain technology first, and, and what that is what it is and uh, once again there's a lot of different definitions just depending on what conversation you're having <laughs> uh, but really you look at the internet and the internet was a way to exchange data between computers between networks uh, now you have the ability to exchange value uh, between networks and if you get down to it blockchain technology is really the next evolution of databases um, you can think of it as a global database for industries uh, so everybody can be on the same page and know exactly what's going on you don't have to worry about systems not talking back and forth to each other. I mean, just for instance, I'm sure you've had scenarios of if you're on the phone or if you're at a store and they're like, well, sorry, we don't have it in the system. Well, that's because one database is not talking to another database. Mm-hmm. And with the blockchain technology, the idea is to have this global industry-wide database where things do talk back and forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a lot of technology being built on top of this, and we're looking at um, – we're building a lot of stuff, our stuff on top of the public Ethereum blockchain. There's dozens and dozens of different blockchains, and within years, blockchain might not even be the correct term because you've got hash graphs and acrylic graphs, and you have all kind of other things that are that are morphing out of this. So we're very very early in this technology, probably where the internet was in 1994, like dial up for Google, mm-hmm. so very early. But it's some cool stuff. Um, but getting to smart contracts now, this is this is where the true innovation lies, I believe. It's the ability to take like a, a formal contract with clauses in that and and put that in the code um, to basically look at the smart contract and have something that executes based on certain parameters, certain terms and conditions. Um, and that it's in itself is going to eliminate a lot of things, a lot of industries, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of people. Um, that's just one use case for me. I was paying a developer 
and um, he was in Canada, and I had a little wire money to him, and I had to go to the bank, drive all the way across town, I had to spend 30 minutes in the bank, setting up the wire for him, $45 international wire fee, and he got his money in five to seven business days, okay? I could have cashed out that money, put it in a FedEx box, and got it there quicker. Yeah. That's how many intermediaries our banking system had, how many touch points. The next time I had to pay him $5,000, I said right here, I sent him $5,000 in Ethereum, Ether. Hmm. He got it in 13 seconds, and it cost me three pennies. That's pretty good. I didn't have to ask anybody for permission. I didn't have to rely on a bank or anybody to facilitate that. Yeah. The network actually facilitated that. And that was, that was three, two years ago. That $5,000 payment is a whole lot more now. <laughs> uh, but uh, that right there, I just understood that okay, this is, this is big, and there's a lot of merit into what we can do with this. And you know, being here in, in this country, our financial system is pretty good. I mean, you can go to the bank, you, know, you can buy and sell, trade stocks. It's mm-hmm. really, uh, we have the strongest financial system in the world. You look at other countries that have dictators that overthrow governments and demolish banks, and mm-hmm. you're on the run. You don't have identity, and how do you how do you have money? Just, just difficult the difficulties in other countries and that's really where cryptocurrency is really going to help out there um, but that's completely other topic let me get back to this <laughs> uh, so cryptocurrency what we're working with if, once again if you think about money and just evolution of money um, kind of starting from shells and, and bags of grain and tea and then pieces of metal and then paper representing money and then kind of where we're at now where it's just fiat currency that doesn't it's not backed by anything it's just it's, it's a shared belief. And if I have a dollar, you just believe it's a dollar because everybody else believes it's a dollar. Mm-hmm. It's just, a, it's just a database entry. Uh, well, now we have this ability to have smart money because that old money is dumb. You can just lay a dollar bill on, on the table and it's not going to do anything. You actually have to have intermediaries to facilitate this payment. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now you can have this, this new type of programmable money, of currency, and you can program it to do certain things. So that's what we're doing. We're programming this new money to do certain things within the healthcare system. That's going to replace a lot of the things that insurance companies do, just facilitating payments for one. Mm -hmm. Um, But we'll start with, um, we have four crypto assets. And I'll start with the first one, it's called Medit. And this is a, it's an ERC-20 token on the Ethereum blockchain. And this, this token is generated when a user pursues a healthy lifestyle. So we're not just generating token and it's not backed by anything. You actually have to go walk, you have to burn calories, you have to get proper sleep, you have to have activity throughout the day to generate this cryptocurrency. Do you have to wear your Fitbit? Yeah. Oh yeah, like right now, yeah. <laughs> he took a fine line. about 300 minutes today. Pretty good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's, it's addicting too because I'm sitting here and I was going to walk out my truck earlier and I was charging and I'm thinking, hang on, I'm not going to get paid. Got to get my Fitbit. Uh, and uh, so that is, that's, that's what we're doing. Um, and I'll get into Humanity here in a minute. But, um, but Meta is basically an incentive token that's earned when you, are, uh, when you do healthy things, when you pursue a healthy lifestyle. And then we have Medix, which is also, um, it's an ERC20 token, but it's a security token um, using the, the polymath uh, t- security token standard. And this is this represents an equity stake in citizen health. So this represents a common stock uh, share of citizen health. So if you own this security token, um, you can actually get a percentage, um, like a dividend from the transactions on our marketplace, which I'll get to in a little bit. But security tokens are really cool. Uh, it's kind of the next thing, next uh, craze coming through. And you probably heard of all the, the ICO stuff of 2017 and 98% of that stuff was scammy. Mm-hmm. And, like all the new, uh, like the altcoins, a lot of all those coins. altcoins. Yeah, I mean, it's, I would say probably 95% of all of those plans and projects are going to fail. I mean, they're just, they're crap. Mm-hmm. You look at them, it's like there's no business model here. It's just, just raise money. Yeah. And rightfully so, most 90% of startups fail anyway, so it's about right. Um, but those, that 10% of companies are going to be the next. Google's and Amazon's and Facebook's. They will completely change the world. Mm-hmm. Hopefully we're in that in that 10%. <laughs> but um, so you got Medix tokens and uh, that that in itself um, should be tradable here hopefully by the end of the year. There's there's a few security token exchanges coming on board. Mm-hmm. Um, T0, uh, Open Finance, 
there's a few more. Um, but eventually, probably within a couple of years, I'll, NASDAQ will begin trading these security tokens. Wow, I've got to uh, take notes. <laughs> yeah, the CEO of NASDAQ, I mean, everybody knows this. J.B. Morgan, Jay, and all your big banks. The thing was, like four years ago, yes, yeah, 2018 already, is it? Four years ago, five years ago, these big banks, they had these little uh, working groups of people trying to figure out this technology and what to do with it. Mm -hmm. I thought it was pretty cool because all those, the, the leads, the heads of those working groups, all quit. <laughs> And they went and started their own thing because nice. they saw the problems of it. <laughs> so um, banks have been gearing up for this for a while. And uh, NASDAQ, they've already issued a few trades, I believe. Um, there's been a couple of large um, bond transfers, a lot of things happening, just testing it out. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're going to see a lot of movement in security tokens in the future. Matter of fact, your IPO, the initial public offering, I'm going to make predictions. So that's, that's probably not going to happen like that. Or those will be securitized mm -hmm. in a security token offering. but getting off topic once again. Uh, oh, that's so, interesting. On, so, so it's not going to be um, applicable um, uh, in the future because of ICOs? No, it's security tokens. Um, you're, you're basically just taking a share, uh, like a paper certificate, mm -hmm. and tokenizing that, um, digitizing it, tokenizing it, and, and having it on stored on the blockchain as a representative on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. So you just have, there's, there's a lot of benefits for that, like liquidity. You know, get in and out of a company uh, quickly. Mm -hmm. For instance, like somebody invests in citizen health right now. If we were just a traditional startup and you invest in us, what's the way you're, the only way you're gonna get your money back is if we sell the company or we go public. And mm -hmm. generally that's gonna be a few years down the road. So mm -hmm. your money's locked up. Um, but with security tokens, if you invest in a company, you can turn around and sell your tokens on an exchange if you don't like where the company's going. If you disagree with what they're doing, you turn around and sell your, well, will your equity stick out and sell it? Mm -hmm. Or if you like it, just keep it in there. Mm -hmm. And also with these medic security tokens, it entitles you to a vote in everything we're doing. So you actually get a vote in the direction of citizen health. Mm -hmm. So a, a lot of things you can do, um, a lot of innovative things you can do with these security tokens that you just couldn't do with a traditional common stock share. Mm -hmm. So we got medic and medics, and then we have two newer types of tokens. And these are non-fungible tokens. Um, up until now, everything we've talked about has been fungible tokens, meaning if, if I have five Ether, I can give you five Ether and we can exchange it, it's still five Ether. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, these non-fungible tokens, meaning you can uh, you can have a token that represents a unique asset um, that nothing else can copy. I mean, it's, just, it's unique, as in it's individually unique. And the ability for this, you probably heard of CryptoKitties, it's kind of the first use case. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have, but it's, it's kind of a, a first use case for these unique assets, almost like a trading card, like a baseball card. Okay. It's unique and maybe nothing else is like it. It might be just a rare one-of-a-kind card. What well, has inherent value in there because it's rare? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the same concept, but this, the non-fungible tokens, actually, it brings to life um, or brings to reality the promise of what blockchain has been talking about the past few years. In terms of tokenizing your assets, like the deed to your property, your marriage certificates, um, things like that. Mm -hmm. You're going to see a lot of innovation with these non fungible tokens moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, but what we're doing with that is called a health service token. That's what we're calling this. So we are taking a, a health service, whatever it may be, um, like just going down the list of whatever um, treatments you provide to your patients and whatever tests, whatever you enter in as that procedural code. So like uh, whatever the top 10 common codes are, instead of taking your service and sending that code to the insurance company to get reimbursed, you're actually going before that and you're taking your service and you're tokenizing it and you're putting it up for sale. So then if you say, if somebody wants my service, here it is, here's the price, purchase it now. Mm -hmm. And somebody can purchase that directly and you get paid automatically. There's no billing, there's no haggling back and forth, there's no... 60 day wait for your money. I mean, it's, it's, it's like Uber. You can get out of the car, that driver's paid automatically. Mm -hmm. Patient leaves your office, you get paid automatically. Mm -hmm. So that's what these health service tokens, this is what's going to be transacted on Metaplex, which is our health and wellness marketplace. So you think of Amazon for surgeries and procedures and treatments. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, uh, like myself, I need a complete knee replacement surgery. I can go to Metaplex. I can input my criteria, what I'm looking for, a surgeon near me, from this price point, uh, with this quality rating, and then I can find this. I 
can have a list of prices and I can purchase that directly. Um, and of course, when you're cutting out insurance, the price will come down a lot because mm -hmm. typically insurance is about 40% of a clinic's overhead, facility's overhead. So now that price comes down and you can pay for it directly or you can structure out payment plans, you know, 12 month payments or whatever you and that, that entity negotiates with. Um, so these, these non-fungible tokens, these health service tokens, open up completely new market dynamics and new ways to, to buy and sell health services. And uh, even more so than that, let's just say, for instance, if a, uh, a large self-funded employer knows they might need 10 knee surgeries a year for their employees, then go ahead and pre-purchase 10 up front, buy in bulk, get a discount. And maybe halfway through the year, they realize that we're not going to need all these. We're going to probably have three or four left over. So instead of being sunk with that cost, they can turn around and resell them back to the marketplace. Uh, of course, they can't make a profit off that because I mean, there's things um, built in to, to prevent some of that. But the idea is this, you can turn around and resell it. It's, it's pretty cool. So that is the three. And then our fourth one is something we're calling a personal health asset. And that is uh, kind of a combination. It's a composable, non-fungible token. It's a, kind of a new standard that's really not being used at all right now. It's very, very new. It's the ability to have a personal uh, a wallet, so to speak, that stores medit, uh, medics, that stores your health service tokens, that basically stores various types of cryptocurrencies and their different standards. Um, it's, it's your personal account. And our idea for this is to, to, to give it, to issue one to every single human, mm -hmm. um, especially with babies. And when they're born, to kind of issue one to them. It's kind of like a savings account, an investment account. And grows with them for life. So, I mean, in theory, this is going to be an account where they can pay for their health services, where they can earn cryptocurrencies for being healthy, and now uh, kind of create it like that. So, really neat use case. And having all four of these together um, power everything that we're doing with health. Mm -hmm. And all four of those together with everything else we're doing creates an entirely new health economy. That's exciting. And so, so just a question about the different tokens. So, the Medit is um, able to be earned by people um, who take care of themselves. So the more you exercise, um, the more calories you burn, the better you eat, the more medits you earn, and can these be applied toward uh, the services that they they request or they need from physicians? Or yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. I might add to that, too. Okay. I'm working with a few vendors um, where initially, you know, these users of, of Humanta they'll be able to take this token and met it and um, kind of treat it as a discount token where they can purchase any health and wellness good or product out there. Let's just start with HelloFresh. I talked to them yesterday, mm -hmm. the meal delivery service. Mm -hmm. And let's just say it's uh, $50 a month for this meal delivery service. Well, if you pay and met it, you can get it for $30 a month. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a discount. You get a 20%, like 30% discount or whatever. Um, kind of like your credit card points. You know, if you have credit card points, you get that entitles you to a discount on a plane ticket. So having met it entitles you to a discount to wellness products and services. Mm -hmm. so that, that's kind of the concept that we're going to use first. And uh, that's that's a model, a discount token model, is something a lot of people experiment with. But that's going to be the first use case. Um, so we're, we're trying to reward people by doing healthy things with the ability to purchase things that could potentially or theoretically make them healthier. Right. So it provides extra incentive. And so with the non-fungible tokens that um, physicians get paid in and that patients pay with, um, are, how are they able to be liquidated into uh, dollars or how does that work? A couple of different ways. So when the physicians get paid, um, initially, you can almost forget the mention of cryptocurrency and just think of just USD because people do get scared of cryptocurrency. They think Bitcoin, black market, drugs, it's you know, connotations <laughs> with that. But this whole model, our whole, whole marketplace, is set up, you can also purchase a service in just direct cash, like USD. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea here is to create a ratio of like say 80% or say a service is $100, you can pay 80% with USD and the other 20% with Meta. Mm -hmm. So the doctor's like, okay, well, basically I'm just offering a discount for their service. Okay, whatever, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But you're still getting theoretically, $100 worth of service, but now we can incentivize the doctor to accept um, Medit and incentivize them with, say, a 10% bonus on top of that. Mm -hmm. uh, because 
it's we are generating this money. It's first time it's ever been possible. So now we can incentivize them. So now they have one hundred ten dollars in value for a one hundred dollars service. Uh, the doctors can either they can sell the med it back on an exchange for whatever the market price is. Uh, it will fluctuate based on demand, or they can convert that into a medics token, which is the stake in Citizen Health. Mm -hmm. And by having that stake in Citizen Health, it also entitles them to a, a transaction dividend from that process that they just had with their patient. Mm -hmm. That happens all across the country, all across the world. Um, all those small, minute transactions are actually dividend checks to them. So they're incentivized to, to keep that medit and you know, keep percentage of that payment as medics um, to, to, to back up the network, to strengthen it, to, to, to really to strengthen the value of everything. Um, but they can also sell that on the security token exchange. So kind of like you just get a share of Apple and you can hold it if you want to or you can turn it and sell it. Okay. You do. Gotcha. And so I guess my next question leading up to it is why not just um, – Use cash. What are what are what is the main benefit of using the cryptocurrency, yeah. and the tokens? I don't see a problem with cash, and like I said, we're we're gonna start with cash. I mean, that's people will be paying with cash, but the the benefit of having a token is, for one, it's you can program to do things. So it's kind of like you can't we can't just generate USD out of thin air to pay somebody to walk. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we can do that technically with cryptocurrencies. So now we're really just in, we're bringing in a new form of currency, and we're assigning value to that, that currency. Or I would say the the person, the individual, is assigning value to this currency based on the the effort they put into walking and the time they spent at the gym, um, the time they spent sleeping past six hours. You know, just getting a healthy, uh, just pursuing a healthy lifestyle. So there's value in that for them. So they are technically setting the price for whatever they think their contribution to that token is worth. Mm -hmm. So uh, so the idea here is to really to create a closed loop economy where people are generating medit for being healthy. They're purchasing health services uh, based off the token they just earned and the doctors can turn around and either stake that those tokens and earn money from these transactions in the network or just sell it for USD. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, you know, USD they can just pay directly to that. There's a couple different models. The idea of what we're trying to do is just create transparency, 100% transparency and affordable pricing. So however we can get that down the most, that's what we're, that's what we're focused on. That's what your goal is. Awesome. And so I guess that leads me to uh, an important question for me because I'm a, a specialist. I'm a neurologist and I order you know, expensive tests that may not have to be as expensive as they are now because of third party payers. So you know, um, MRIs are at least a thousand dollars. And so is, is there any thought, I know you have some, uh, you're incorporating some specialists into your, uh, services. How, are there any uh, thoughts about how to decrease the cost of expensive lab tests and expensive, um, imaging for patients in citizen health? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, uh, definitely. I know, the MRIs, um, I'm kind of exchange emails, and I've got some pricing. Um, uh, MRIs can be very drastically. You probably know you go. Heck, it's not even one side of the country, other side of the country. One side of the street, the other side of the street, very thousand dollars. Um, but um, basically, the MRI was fine, and uh, there's a couple that you provided. Uh, it's about four hundred fifty dollars to five hundred fifty dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working. One of our, I mentioned, we have two. Two of our first pilots. Um, one is with uh, Green Imaging. They're a medical diagnostic facility or company. They have a lot of locations across Texas, mm -hmm. and uh, they have some really cheap prices for MRIs. Very affordable. And like I said, it's anywhere between two hundred fifty dollars to seven hundred fifty dollars for pretty much any MRI you want. That's great. And uh, that right there, I mean, that's that's just cash price. That's cutting out insurance. Now, if you had if you had to bill insurance, yeah, it's probably gonna, the insurance company is going to pay. Uh, it's going to cost a whole lot more. I mean, it's just it's not an effective way to pay for a service. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't go to the grocery store and throw all my groceries on the checkout aisle. Like, here's my insurance. Just bill them. <laughs> don't do that. Yeah. And, uh, so healthcare services don't need to be. They're not expensive. Like the actual the cost of them 
is not expensive. The price is very expensive because you have all the other factors in. Uh, but the idea here is to, to look at labs. I mean, same way with labs. Uh, just go with the direct contracting model, just pay directly, cut out insurance. Um, the labs will, will drop drastically. And you're talking about genetic testing. Now, this is, and this is something I'm very passionate in, is personalized medicine and just genetics. I'm looking at your genetics. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, 10 years ago, the cost to sequence a full genome was like $10 million. Yeah. Well, today it's about $400. Yeah. In a few years, it's going to be $10. Yeah. So, almost free. So that that cost is dropping dramatically. It's not it's not rolling over to the patient where they're saving money. I mean, there's still that price is still up there. Mm-hmm. Um, but in the coming years, these tests will be cheaper and cheaper. Uh, and if you just cut out insurance and you just go with a transparent model and a direct payment model, mm-hmm. um, in theory, is the free market forces will come come into play and it will drive down cost and the quality will also increase. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah. that's what we're introducing is with Metaplex is just free market principles. Yeah, yeah. And so I guess translating into the pharmaceutical world, um, are, are there any plans to help drive down costs for certain medications? No definite plans yet, but I know that, that's my it's complicated. My, yeah. my background is uh, I just saw how inefficient this stuff was. And I sit there, I talked to a, a CEO from India, I forgot which pharmaceutical company it was, and uh, he laughed at me. He said, you Americans, he said, our drugs, like per pill, it's sub a penny, like under a penny. He said, y'all are selling for $100 a pill over there. Yeah. Look at that markup. And he's just laughing at us. And, uh, and that's, that's reality. But these things don't cost that much yeah. at all. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's irrationally inflated by having uh, these pharmacy benefit managers, the just all the people trying to get a cut of this, and it doesn't need to be that much. And you start cutting these out, and you start going to these um, wholesale pricing models, uh, the cost comes down. And for instance, with direct primary care, these doctors, um, there, there's a couple, there's like two wholesale, um, pharmaceutical wholesale companies they get their medications from. And I don't know anything off the top of my head, but they are cutting these prices, oh, almost like 98%. Of, of what people want to know. It's not like pennies on the dollar of um, just your common medication. And they're dispensing in house. So you don't have to go to the pharmacy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they're saving a whole lot of money on that. Uh, and I think that model is only going to grow. I think people will see that more and more. Um, uh, and pharmacy benefit managers, they serve no purpose, in my opinion, from what I've seen. I agree. Like, <laughs> oh my gosh, I work with one, one PBM, and here's the process. And I don't know if they're all like this, but. They, they bought millions of dollars worth of pharmaceuticals from China and brought them over here and broke that up and sold it to all these pharmacists across the country. And then they didn't own the sales force, but they worked with this company to, to hire their sales reps to go out there and promote the drugs they just sold to all the pharmacies. So now they're getting a cut on what those, ph- those sales reps sold, and they're also getting a rebate back to manufacturing. manufacturing. So it's like, how many times do you want to stick your hand in the cookie jar? Oh my God, that's horrible. And I don't know if they're all like that. I'm, I'm sure they are. Nobody <laughs> really knows what a PBM does. Yeah, because like you said earlier, there's no transparency. Nobody knows yeah. how much they pay themselves. And they're not required to report how much they pay themselves, right? Or mm-hmm. the breakdown. I, I mean, it's, it's horrible. And even, I mean, just going back to the cost of medications and, you know, I, I deal with um, sick patients with neurological diseases, the, the medications for a lot, of, for the treatment of many of these uh, conditions is, has skyrocketed from the 1990s to now. And like I, I had mentioned in one of my emails to you, you know, the cost of medication for MS has gone up by like, what, 10, like, so from from the 1990s, the average cost per year was 8,000 to 11,000, and now 76,000 to $83,000 per year. Um, you know, I, I had a patient the other day complaining to me because they wanted, I had prescribed them a new medication for seizures, and guess how much it cost them for for a month, $600. They couldn't afford it. And it's just, it's horrible because it prevents me from being able to appropriately treat people. So 
I, I, I'm very hopeful about your company and very excited to see the great things that will happen with, with you in Citizen Health. Thank you. Thank you. We're definitely, we're going to need some help too. So if you want to help. Absolutely. Uh, it's a, it was a grassroots effort. You know, we see that the status quo is not going to change itself. I mean, the status quo is the status quo because it built itself that way. Yeah. You know, people say the healthcare is broken. No, it's, it's, it was designed this way. We designed this system back when we instituted uh, health insurance, especially you started looking at around 1982. When we uh, when Medicaid, Medicare, or when Medicare required uh, CPT codes and DRG codes to be used mm -hmm. for every service to get paid, and Medicaid was a few years after that. So essentially, like we gamified that. We allowed people, we gave a blueprint to people to uh, basically print money, saying if you do these services this, this many times and these particular services, um, we're going to pay you this much. Mm -hmm. So then it's like that uh, a law of the hammer, you know, if you give a man a hammer, Tell him to pay him to hammer nails. Everything he sees is going to look like a nail. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of what we did with the fee for service model. Is um, there's a lot of unnecessary tests that are done, and the more unnecessary tests happen, and there's a lot of complications from that. And just costs go up. And if you look at health insurance in general, um, they're not incentivized to. They don't care about the high prices of health care of, of services because the higher the prices, the more they make. That's isn't the it that they have to isn't it like 15 percent like they have yeah. they get 15 percent to their shareholders and it and it as the, the the number like the absolute amount of money grows that 15 percent will grow along with yeah. it that's like people don't understand that's like 15 percent of a bigger number is a bigger number yeah so if they say okay just bill us for however much you want we're gonna pay it and then we're that's going to justify us increasing the premiums the next year. Yeah. And it's just, that happens every single year. So it's getting out of control. Like right now, the average family of four, um, the annual premiums right now, 2018, is $28,000 a year. Like that, what? That's yeah. some, that's more than mortgages. Yeah. Like really. Yeah. And uh, it's estimated that in 10 years, that's going to be $50,000. That's going to be an average salary just to pay for the premiums. That's not out of pocket. Out of pocket And, and like you said, it's this is all, I mean, it's mainly what we're practicing in the system is reactive medicine anyway. So we're keeping people alive, barely, by putting Band-Aids and not even focusing on prevention because we don't have the time because we have to see like 2,500 patients a year instead of focusing on a few select patients who we can spend time with and really work on prevention and, you know, all of these different Things. So, I mean, anyways, I'm ranting right now, but no, that's that's the truth. And every, pretty much every physician feels the same way you do. Yeah. But you don't go to you don't go to med school to make a whole lot of money. I mean, you do to extent, but you don't go in it for just the profit motive. I mean, you go into it because you want to help patients. Mm -hmm. And the system is not set up for you to do what you love to do. Yeah. Uh, the system doesn't pay you to do that exactly. Like, it doesn't pay you to be proactive sit down there and talk to the patient. I mean, I, I've never seen a billing code where, you know, you, you can get paid for 30 minute conversation with your patient. It just mm -hmm. it doesn't really happen that way. And uh, that's that's what we really want to bring in is the proactive side of medicine and really keep people out of the hospital. Like, number one goal, like, what is healthcare? Like, what are we trying to do as a country? Are we trying to create this huge medical industry that profits off people's unhealthy situations? Or are we trying to create a system that keeps people out of the hospital. And it's proactive that tries to elevate their health. Mm -hmm. When you think about it, it says a, a macro level, if everybody is healthier, let's just say 1% healthier, I don't know what that equates to, but the economic output has to be higher. I mean, people are gonna be taking less days off of work. And they're gonna be healthier, so mm -hmm. then they're gonna have better outputs at work. You know, the, the revenue, the theory is gonna go up in, in workforces. Um, contribute more back into the economy. Uh, it seems like the solution for a lot of problems. I mean, I've I've re recently mentioned you know we waste more in healthcare in two weeks than it would cost to completely eliminate homelessness in America. Wow. 
Yeah. Like, uh, of course, it's logistically would be difficult to do, but just <laughs> the, the monetary part of it. I mean, we waste nine hundred billion dollars a year. That's more than our whole entire military budget. Mm-hmm. We're we doing wrong, yeah. and uh, I do believe having insurance uh, is what we're doing wrong. It's just the whole business model. And, uh, it's, something's got to give. Something's got to change. Mm-hmm. And over the past few years, I've seen a lot of people pointing fingers saying, hey, they need to do this, they need to do that. Nobody's actually stepping out and saying, all right, let's just do it. Yeah. Let's do it. Make the change, let's put it. Let's bring the physicians on board, let's mm-hmm. bring the patients on board, the, the employers who are paying a lot of this, and the caregivers. And let's redesign a new healthcare system around these people. Yeah. And let's forget about all those shareholders over there. Sorry, you made a lot of money, but you're not needed. You're not mm-hmm. providing value. Let's yeah. look at the people who actually provide value. And uh, build something for the next generation, something that's going to be sustainable. Right for our children. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think I think you're right. It starts with the patients. It starts with the physicians um, and the nurses standing up to oh, yeah. the the system and the way it is, and kind of putting our foot down. Physicians in general have kind of acquiesced to a lot of demands, and I think it's time for us to start saying. No, we're going to go our separate ways and we're going to enter direct care, direct primary care, direct specialty care, and start um, uh, gaining honor from our, our careers and uh, restoring our love for medicine. So I really appreciate you talking with me, Brennan. It's very inspiring. Thank you, Anna. I appreciate it. Yeah, and I uh, hope to, to keep in touch. And uh, one, one last question um, before we, we end. How does well? How does a person interested in, in investing in uh, citizen health uh, go about doing that? Um, and then also, how does the physician who's interested in learning more uh, learn more? Okay, um, on our website, citizenhealth.io, we have a, a link for uh, it's called for investors, and uh, it's going to bring me to a page, kind of just give me some details, and then we have a crowdfunding campaign on Start Engine. It's kind of like a Indiegogo or Kickstarter, but it's an equity crowdfunding campaign, and uh, it's capped at a million based on the regulation. Uh, that will be open. Uh, we're actually changing up the whole entire campaign page. The message kind of clarifies some things a bit, um, but probably another 60 days um, once we do uh, launch that, and uh, that's the best way. And you go in there, and in three minutes, you can invest in citizen health. It's very easy. Uh, so I'm going to put a link in our in my uh, the, the description of the YouTube video on, to that. For people right. to find. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. And um, also with physicians um, coming on board, we also have a, a four physicians a tab for doctors on our website. Um, and uh, just put in your information there and uh, help us help us fix this because that's what it's going to take. And that's what I've been doing recently is just talking to all sorts of physicians from all different sides. And I will say that we are looking for an advisory board. We're building out an advisory board of, of physicians that want to see healthcare change and. We're looking at specialties, subspecialties, really trying to build out a, a strong force of people uh, that can, can help spread the word and change this because the idea of, of this whole system is something that's that's owned and controlled by us. Mm-hmm. You're actually going to own the system. So you can vote. If you don't like it, then raise awareness, get people to vote, and we'll change the direction of what we're doing. So the whole thing is going to be crowdsourced. That's the idea. It's, it's a liquid democracy. It's kind of what we're applying to this. Yeah, that's great. So, yeah, so just contact me directly if you have any other questions. Okay. Yeah. yeah, feel free to start up a chat. Very cool. Thank you. Is there anything else that you want to tell us today before we we end? Yeah, well, I think I may have mentioned it, but uh, we do have a uh, beta registration open for Humanta. We are launching August the 15th. Uh, if you do have a Fitbit or Apple Watch or anything you want to start testing out, mm-hmm. um, you go to our website, click on Humanta, then there's a, a form to fill out. And now uh, we are uh, giving away $200 in free medics if you do want to sign up and join us. Awesome. So, uh, yeah. And this Come is on. nationwide, not just in Texas and Mississippi. Well, it's global, history. actually. We've had, oh. had some people across the, across the world already sign up for this. That's great. Oh, so before I let you go, this that's also another thing. It's going to be a global in, initiative. So um, it'll hopefully in the future provide, improve the, the quality of care in other countries, right? Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We've been, I've been getting a lot of feedback saying you need to go outside of America and yeah. start elsewhere. Um, India, we actually have um, somebody that's going to be joining our team, an infectious disease doctor from India. And he 
he says they need something like this. And they have hardly any financial uh, healthcare infrastructure. I do have insurance companies, but they're, it's not like 75% cash pay, like out of pocket. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many countries that need something like this. So going to them and starting this movement, um, that could be one of the, the probably the first things that actually takes hold maybe, because it's gonna be hard. It's, it's a fight here in America. If you've got the status quo, it's gonna fight us. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the idea is to be global um, because the health, everybody, you get down to it, you know, the health of, our health is our greatest asset. If you're on, if they're on your deathbed, you'll give every single dollar you have to, to buy another day. Yeah. It's, and it's all across the board. So yeah, we're there to help to help everybody. And we have some ambitious plans to do that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Brennan. I look forward to keeping in touch with you. All right, thanks. All right, take care.